Kia ora, good evening and welcome back to our first hui of 2024 and it's going to be exciting indeed. Club Rugby starting this weekend with the Swindale Shield and we've got some real blockbusters including a grand final rematch from last year. So we're going to be previewing that later in the show. We've got our first guest on tonight. He's been uh, hounding me for weeks on end wanting to come here. He's a big fan of the show and joining us on the Hari Hui tonight is Alex Hinchcliffe. Alex, many thanks for coming on the Hari Hui. How's your off-season been? No, thanks for having me, Mr Hudson. I know it's uh, big for you to have me here, the biggest guest of the year. Um, <laughs> how's, the, how's the free season going? Yeah, pretty good. We're, we're, we're pre-season, off-season. Feeling good, looking fit, excited for the week. Now, of course, Parramatta Plymouth and last year, we'll talk about uh, last year's Stellar season. It's uh, probably going to be turned into a, a novel or a movie before you know what, what happened last year at that club. But let's talk about Parramatta Plymouth and heading on to this season. Uh, what is happening at the club, not only just with the uh, Premier team, but with all the other grades? What, how's the club preparing for season 2024? Yeah, uh, this season's looking awesome. I think we have uh, the 21s are full. Like they've got an amazing team, 85s, the women's teams, they're all pretty strong and just building off last year. Um, so it's exciting to see some young talent coming through and new faces joining on joining on the bandwagon. Now, of course, um, some clubs in particular have been pretty active during pre-seasons. How's Parramatta Plumberton been in the pre-season? Who have you guys played against and how's the team gone in those games? Uh, yeah, we we had a couple of like a little tournament up in Tongariro, and they went pretty well. And then we had OBU last week, and yeah, I think they just got ahead of us. That was a good little hit out for us to sort of uh, you know dust out the cobwebs. But I think our checkbooks ran out, so we weren't able to bring in as many new players. As the club. <laughs> so we're we're struggling a little bit this preseason, but we'll see how it goes. Now, of course, um, in the off-season, a lot of clubs announce a whole lot of new players or people joining yeah. the club. Let's talk about Parramatta Plymouthton. You've got some new signings. Um, you've also yeah. got some uh, pretty impressive uh, players that have made the move out to Nati Toa in 2024. Yeah, yeah, we've, uh, there's a few good new faces. I think we've got, like, Alex Fidel, Vic Fiso. I guess I, won't, I don't really want to say it, but Sam Mayo's been a good addition as well. Um, he's been a, he's been a great addition to the team. I'm probably missing out a couple of the new faces. I probably wrote it down actually, just in case this question came up. But yeah, those three have been a pretty pretty good addition. Um, Cody as well has come from the UK from the, from the back. So, but again, like we're just building on, having a solid team, and I think holding on to the majority of the players from the last couple of years that have joined us. Now, of course, last year, 2023, was an amazing year for the club. The Premier side yeah. pulling in big crowds coming away with trophies that many at the club probably thought you would never win, including the Swindale Shield. Let's talk about last year, um, in particular, the highs of that season. Uh, what was it yeah. like for you, who had been in that club for a long time? But in particular, how are you going to take what you guys achieved in 2023 and take it into this season? It's, it's, it's a big, that was a big question, actually. I don't know it was part to answer first. Um, yeah, I guess there was no secret, I guess, two, two, three years ago we started to really build something. I guess when I came back, we started winning, so that was quite good. Um, but I think uh, G's built a really good culture there. People are bought in, and for like the players that are stuck around, like myself, Penny, Tane, Luco, Mary, uh, and Junior, like just the, the drive for competition, the drive to fight for your spot, you know, we're making better decisions in our day-to-day -day life, and I think the, the culture... Yeah, it's just been an awesome culture. I think everyone's excited and wants to be there in training. You know, every Tuesday, I get to training, every Thursday, G gives me a big hug and a kiss. And that's probably the only reason I go, just to get that, because I don't get it at home. But um, yeah, I think we just keep building on that culture and just see where it goes with that. And I think, um, yeah, we can't rest on, on last year's results. I mean, every other, like, I think we caught a lot of teams off guard this year, or last year, sorry, I lost my bearings. Um, so it's just they're all going to be out for out for blood, and so we've just got to do what we're going to do this year. Let's wind back the clock, and where did your rugby journey start for you? Um, I was actually a Parramatta Plum junior, so I started at 12 years old. So I think I was under 13 in my first year. Um, then kind of chopped chop and changed schools a bit, went down south, and then finished at Wellington College. And I was obviously the star of the first team there in my last year. Um, we, we lost that final 
very similar to uh, the final we lost last year where I didn't I was on the bench so again a bit of a coincidence <laughs> but, um, yeah and then then just I uh, kind of left overseas straight after school and came back and joined Paramount Plymouth just for social aspect and then kind of got drawn into the premier squad there early days and just never looked back except I obviously left in 2019 and a couple of years over playing in the UK and Canada and then came back I had a new coach Justin Wilson great guy but we didn't gel as a rugby tie sort of had a gap year again and then came back when G came back so it came to us how have you found playing overseas in those uh, certain stints you've been overseas playing what's it like over there and where did you play uh, I played in Canada, just like their premier rugby, um, just because I was living there, and that was really cool. Like, a lot of expats. There was a couple of ex-professionals there as well. I kind of juggled them, and, and that's how I got the idea to go to the UK and I'm playing in the National 2 South there. Um, but as big as I am, I was tiny there, and I just I didn't really like the club. Like, it was a... Oh, it just doesn't, it didn't have the same sort of family culture here. It was good, though. Like, it was... I think it did make me take the fitness a bit more seriously, and go to the gym as you could probably see um but yeah I, I think the family club culture here in, in Paramount Plymouth is pretty unlike the others but yeah Canada was a good time UK was was all right it was a good experience I suppose and but coming back last three seasons I definitely fell out of love with it of the game in England so having a couple of years off and then coming back to Paramount Plymouth has made me enjoy it again more Wellington College of course has been well known for a rugby school and great success over the years. Uh, you mentioned how you made the final that year, but tell us about your time in the first 15 at Wellington College. Who coached you, and uh, who was it that you lost to in the final that year? Uh, yeah, we had, who was the coaches? It was my good friend Lincoln Rawls, Greg Sharland. I'm sure there was someone else, but I, I'm probably missing them. Um, but those are the two, the big cheeses there. Um, it was really cool. I think I was in there for more for just the talking rubbish than my rugby skills, um, but <laughs> we won, or we drew a quad final. Luke Campbell missed a couple of kicks there, but we won't talk about that either. Um, and then we lost in the final, so to Silver String, and I couldn't tell you played in that Silver String team, to be honest, it's a long time ago. I'm getting on almost 30 now, and we wouldn't think it, but it's a long time ago now. Uh, time flies, doesn't it? And of course, um, yeah. did you get to play in the uh, quad tournament at all during your time there? I did, yeah, we, um, yeah, we went down to Christ College. So we played Wong and the first game and then Nelson College second game. So it was quite cool. I think there's an old clip of Nelson and Sofa Solomona just running for everybody on that one. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty cool experience going down there. We had, a, we had a very talented team in terms of some big names like yeah, Nelson, James Blackwell, Wes Hoyson, uh, just to name a few of the stars. And yeah, it was a pretty stacked team and then obviously me. Now, of course, you mentioned you went overseas, but uh, why was you know you said you were Parramatta Plymouth and junior, but what what was the main reason for you to go back to the club uh, at your senior level? Uh, it was probably I was living out these ways, and uh, I think there was a few friends that went there. We were just playing social twenty ones, so we had a really fun twenty ones team that year. There was about um, yeah six or seven of my good mates at the time that were like we're going to go do it, and I kind of again I got over rugby a bit then. Just jumped in the 21 squad, enjoyed it, and the, the club culture was amazing. I think the, the coach at the time, Dave Durney, brought me in pretty early, and the the senior players took, really took me under the wing and then sort of loved it. And it's, it feels weird to now not be one of those younger players and be the senior player, but yeah, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a cool club at the time. We always had a good culture, uh, we just didn't always have the results to go with it, so now it's nice having a good balance of both. Now let's talk about the, those times when the club uh, really it got into Premier, but it battled its way through and had some tough times. Let's talk about um, most of your career at the club. What was it like during those tough times and what were some of the key motivating things that kept not only you, but your fellow club members fighting to where you are today? Yeah, yeah, it was. I think I, I was fortunate to miss a couple of the biggest, darkest years, I think Tane calls them. Um, but yeah, I think from... <laughs> 2014 coming into that I think yeah it was it was deflating you know like losing most games and I think we showed pride in a lot of those games and I think it was just the the, the pride in the area the pride in the club that sort of kept you going and sticking it out and, and putting some respectability in the scoreline I think in, in 2018 we really started to show that I think with uh, uh, Bill Gibb and Mike Hunter who were amazing coaches and 
uh, really did wonders. Unfortunately, they didn't stick around or get the opportunity to stick around because that year we well, we won three on the bounce, which was first ever in our club's history. Um, built a pretty talented squad, and but unfortunately, just they they left the next year, and so did uh, abundance of other players, and kind of went into those yeah the next couple of years. But yeah, pretty tough, I'd say. I, I don't really remember any particular embarrassing games. It's kind of all blacked that out now. Now, you're a very versatile forward, but what is your preferred p- position and why? The flanks or being hooker in the team? <laughs> uh, well, Frank's been egging me on to decide where I think I should just stay as uh, just whatever they want me to, whatever gets me on the team sheet. I don't really care, to be honest with you. I'll, I'll be in the backs. I used to be in the backs back in the day, but that speed's gone now, long gone. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed playing flanker last year. I think it was a lot more freedom because... I don't know if you've watched many games, but I can't run, I can't kick, I can't pass, I can just tackle. So it was kind of nice to be given that free just to do that. Um, but I do like hook, I like front ball in. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm obviously not the biggest front rower in the world, so it was nice to sort of be, be a normal size in the, in the back row. But yeah, no, I'll just, wherever the team needs me, I don't, I don't mind. Now you mentioned about uh, Gerard Vasavalu at the club. Tell us about uh, his influence. He's been there a few seasons now, and what has he brought to the club that really has resulted in this culture change? Do you want me to do my best impression of him? I've got a that, few there good, we go. Uh, up, yeah. One liners that he pulls out. Yeah. <laughs> what is his, what's his best and best one liners? I think one of my favourite ones is well, he always says it's not about who's the toughest Islander, and I don't know what the moral is because I can kind of take that directly to me. Um, but yeah, he has some good one liners. I think the his general um, the relationship, he's a relationship builder. I think he really makes you feel important. Each person, like whether it's Prem, Prem Reserve, Women's 21s, A5s, um, makes time and effort to get to know you and the family. And it's created that more of a family environment. And you can see why people followed him, besides the $600 a week as well. But I think it's that kind of characteristics that brought all these people here and makes you want to sort of fight for him. Um, and he's obviously got an amazing team behind him as well with, with the other coaches and managers. And, yeah, all of them really make the effort. So the big difference that we, we just I haven't personally experienced um, to that level. I mean, like I said, I've had some great coaches before and went in college and, and Mike and, and Phil. But it's just, yeah, it's, it's taken to another level this, this last three years with him. There was a comedy movie by the same title as well. There was a newspaper article by the same title as well. It's called Dude, Where's My Car? Can you tell us oh, what yeah. happened in 2017 regarding uh, that? that. <laughs> have you done your research, eh? I have done your research. <laughs> uh, what, are you on the long-winded story or they're just short and oh, sharp? You, I don't know. Oh, no, you give us the big one. That'd be good. It's a good story. Right, okay. <laughs> um, it was actually funny enough before rugby training and I parked up. My friend's got a food truck around Brown Bay. And I was like, parking up and go see him. And I'm pretty bad still to this day, leaving my keys in the car. And it's pushed to start. <laughs> the fence. So, um, so I get out, having a yarn to him. And I, sort of, uh, I was like, I should probably go to training now. And my bag's in the front seat, whatever. And I go out and my car's not there. Like, the hell, where's it gone? And then I'm still looking around. But, and I put on a group chat to the boys. I was even grabbing my car thing and they just trying to take the purse. And um, some guy was kayaking around Browns Bay, and I said, you say it took my car? And, and he was like, here's some lady jumped in. I thought it was your mum. And I was like, my mum doesn't live here. And I was like, oh, shit, that's not good. So then I saw, like, three cars up. There was the exact same car as mine parked up there. And I was like, oh, shit. So I put on the community page with a photo of their car saying, does anyone drive the wrong car home that night? And I didn't get any helpful comments, just a whole lot of, uh, other people just taking the piss basically. So I left, they eventually called the cops and I was like, I think someone was accidentally taking my car. And they're like, you sure it's not stolen? And I was like, I'm pretty sure. So they gave them that plate, called up some old lady in the hut. I shouldn't say old, uh, middle-aged <laughs> woman in the hut. And then she, um, they're like, did you take the right car home? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, you sure? And she's like, go check your plates. And then, so she drove me, drove it back. Fortunately, I was on e-lights, so she had to fill up as well. Um, <laughs> drove and she was, oh, I'm so sorry, my daughter leaves my car for me. And I felt a bit bad for her, so I was, oh, don't worry about it. Because like, I woke up the next day and had like quite a few calls and texts from like newspaper people or whatever, wanting to do an article on it. And I was like, nah, pull, feel for the old lady, just leave it. Um, yeah. And then uh, I think later that afternoon, I was having some drinks, and someone told me that lady was on the radio telling the story. And I was like, oh, 
But, excuse my French. Um, so I was like, I'll do it then. So the lady sang, I'll do the story and had a few drinks. So I told the story probably a bit better than I did now because I've only had one drink so far. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I ended up getting, I think, half a tank of fuel. A magazine article paid me like 280 bucks to do the story as well um, and good publicity. So it was a, a win-win for me, really. But it was, uh, yeah, it was it was viral for a bit, I think. Um, yeah. That's it. Oh, fascinating story. Now, of course, any of your other um, stories that you've had in your rugby career as well? Honestly, I've had so many head knocks that I don't really remember much. Of my, rugby. <laughs> my highlight of my rugby, not my rugby career personally, was probably uh, your show watching it last year and watching Sam Clark battle through the internet. And that, oh. that was probably my favourite uh, rugby memory, I suppose, it's rugby related. But no, yeah. I don't think I've got to. To, to there was Paul Latham said to me last year, there's something wrong with Parramatta, play, Parramatta Plimpton players on the internet. <laughs> Louis Northcote was no better either. You're going very well tonight, so I hope you have a good well, day. I'm in the wop wop. I'm in the, yeah. I'm in the, I'm in the, the get, not the ghetto, but I'm in Puka Bay, mate. We're fancy up here. Yeah. <laughs> now, we mentioned uh, when we were sitting up this interview, you're quite close to 100 games. Tell us how many games you're currently on. Um, uh, and. Um, yep. Are you hoping to achieve that this season? Because there's a lot of competition within the team. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm on 88, but I'm not counting. Um, so hopefully stay injury free. I mean, only last year broke two fingers. So this year, as long as I don't do that again, should should get it. But yeah, there's a lot of competition, I think. But it's a very healthy drive. Like I want to be involved, but I also want to put the team first. So if it means I go stick around another year next year, we'll see. But yes, yeah. So, yeah. In, in touching distance, hopefully that comes about. Who's the toughest uh, rugby player you've played against? Who's the toughest rugby player? Oh, good question. Um, I know there's, like, there'll be quite a few people to be upset if I don't name them. But I, I don't, <laughs> I, to be honest, I'm terrible with other teams. Like I don't, I don't watch any rugby. I don't really follow too much of it. I would actually say the toughest person, and it's actually an own team, and I hate tackling him or doing anything. If I see he's holding a tackle bag, I'll just walk away. It's Penny. That man is brick wall. It's, it's disgusting. I hate it. And it's, it's fun. We're, we're training, just relax. But he's the, the loveliest guy in the world. But yeah, that man is just made of rocks. Now, outside of rugby, we can tell that you're in this profession because you love telling a story. You're a real estate agent during the week for Harcourts. Uh, tell us about yeah. uh, that lifestyle um, in real estate. Um, and how do you feel having to show passion on a Sunday when your body is sore? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a sleazy salesman, uh, obviously. And it, uh, but no, it's a, it's, a, it's a cool profession. You sort of work all hours and like, after training sometimes and going back out to work. Um, but I think it's a, playing rugby, it's made of a good not icebreaker, but, but conversation starters with a lot of people, that they're, they're, especially now that we're doing well, very, very interested in it. But, yeah, it was pretty bad. I think it was last year after, I think it was a winery game where I broke a finger and had a black eye. So turning up to an open home in a cast and a black eye, was not <laughs> ideal on it. Sunday morning, and even the nurse when I was at A&E, she was like, this looks like a fight. And I'm not a scrap, well, I can't scrape any more now to my fingers, but, yeah, so... So yeah, not not does it go well together? It goes all right together. I think definitely getting business from the club, but um, that's not why I joined the club. It was never about business. No, we we'll have to talk to you about sponsorship for the Hui, but we never know. We'll get there one day. I've got um, my money. Talk to Elliot. <laughs> talk to Marty. He's got all the money. He's got all the. <laughs> now let's uh, wrap things up. But let's talk about round one this weekend. It's the repeat of the Jubilee Cup final. Uh, you have to travel yeah. out to the Polo Ground. To start your defence yes. of the Swindale Shield, um, tell yeah. us um, about the challenge against Oriental Rongatai. What have you learnt after the final last year, and what ch challenges are you going to have to face going out to the Polo Ground, which is one of the tough grounds in Wellington Club Rugby? Yeah, it's awful. They don't tell them I said that. Um, <laughs> I think they, they uh, the big boys there, the, the, the biggest team in the comp, and for some reason they seem to always run at me because I'm a little redhead. Um, so I hate it, but it's going to be tough. I think what have we learned from that final? Not try to play their game, but yeah, I think they're going in as, as, as favourites this week, given their, their size and, and like their form into last year. Um, and they've, obviously they've recruited well as well. So 
but I always like playing them. They're, they're a great family club, as well as similar to ours and our, our size. So um, excited about it. Yes, going out there, not really, but the, the play again, been looking forward to it all year. So, yeah, it's been felt like ages since we played. Alex, it's been fantastic having you on for our first episode of the year on the Huddy Hui. All the best for Saturday and the rest of the season. We'll see you around the grounds, no doubt. You will, mate. Thanks, Huddy. Love you. Bye-bye. Oh, well. oh, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, Alex Hinchcliffe. He is the our first guest of the Hui for 2024. And what a great uh, season Parramatta Plymouth had this se- uh, last year in 2023. Let's see what they can do this year. Tough start against Orient Orangatai first up. Now, late last week, we interviewed our second guest for the Hui, and of course, he is part of the Hurricanes team that is six from six, 100% wins in Super Rugby Pacific, and we caught up with him last Thursday, just before the Highlanders game, which of course, we all know the result of the Highlanders game, but he gave us a good insight into how the, Highl- how the Hurricanes are going in 2024, and this player as well is having a stellar season mainly a fullback, but playing on the wing this year for the Hurricanes. Josh Morby is going to be our next guest coming up soon. In the meantime, we'll just put you on pause until we get the video loaded. Loaded.
coach this season. He's previously was an assistant coach the last time the Hurricanes won the title. He's been off the sevens the last few years. What has he brought to the Hurricanes camp? Uh, I think he's um, brought brought great honesty. Um, he's challenged all of us, you know, from 150 caps to, to zero caps. It's, um, it's awesome to see all of us sort of uh, feed off each other and challenge each other in training and games. Um, and I think it's really, uh, you know, made all of us be better. Uh, I think he's um, brought, brought great honesty. Um, he's challenged all of us, you know, from 150 caps to, to zero caps. It's, um, it's awesome to see. In training and games. Um, and I think it's really, uh, you know, made all of us be better. Okay, so we've got it working now, so hopefully it goes. The Hurricanes, Josh, many thanks for coming on the hui. The Hurricanes, five out of five. What a, what a great start it has been, a successful start to the campaign for the Hurricanes. Uh, what has been the key to the success in the first five weeks? Uh, cheers, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. It's, uh, it's, I think it's, you know, we've had the same team maybe for the last three years so it's um, I'll say probably the unity between between us as a group we've been able to um, you know learn each other's games and um, understand how you know all of us sort of like to play the game and um, I think as a team we're growing growing together very strongly and um, you know under obviously Clark being the new coach and the staff he's got around him um, with the assistance then all not too far out of the game so obviously have the same sort of game sense and um, experience to sort of we as players can use. And, um, yeah, I think it's steering us in a, in a pretty good direction at the moment. Let's talk about uh, Clark Laidlaw, the new Hurricanes coach this season. He's previously was an assistant coach the last time the Hurricanes won the title. He's been off the sevens the last few years. What has he brought to the Hurricanes camp? Uh, I think he's um, brought brought great honesty. Um, he's challenged all of us, you know, from 150 caps to, to zero caps. It's, um, it's awesome to see all of us sort of uh, feed off each other and challenge each other in training and games. Um, and I think it's really, uh, you know, made all of us be better as individuals and as, as a team. Um, you know, we're always fighting uh, for our spots, so it's a competitive, a competitive uh, environment at the moment. Now, of course, two weeks ago you played the Crusaders and, uh, well, I think everyone knows about how they're going, but let's talk about that game. Um, I had a test match feel, it was uh, bloody cold down there and Justin Sankster scores the winner. Uh, tell us how special it is not only to beat the Crusaders but to do it on their own patch down there in Christchurch. Yeah, it's, um, oh, I mean, there's such everyone, you know, for the last, oh, how, you know, since we've been watching rugby, they've been a dominant team and, um, you know, it's always a tough challenge against them. Um, you know, so we we knew we knew what we're up against, and especially like you said down there, had a test match feel. It was it was cold, it was rainy, it was windy, it was you know everything it <laughs> it needed to be for such a highly anticipated clash. And um, yeah, we were we were, uh, got off to a nice start, and I felt like we were growing uh, uh, you know a lot of pressure and putting a lot of pressure on them. Um, it looked like they do. They came back after half time and. Um, credit to to the way we've you know trained through the preseason, and um, it just goes to show how ready we were to you know step into that late um, sort of 20 minute quarter and um, come together as a team and um, you know like you said, thanks to get over the line, which is which is um, yes, yeah, awesome, awesome to get that one. You don't this win too many down there. <laughs> no, it's uh, not every day it happens. So um, yeah. it's one of the toughest places and probably uh, in uh, New Zealand mm. rugby to win. Uh, so this season, you've been on the wing most of the time. Uh, two tries against the Blues, and that was another fantastic game against uh, the Auckland Powerhouse. Um, what is uh, your preferred p position, though? You prefer being a winger or a fullback? <laughs> uh, so the old cliche, eh? you know, uh, no, <laughs> I, I like to be, I, you know, I'll go anywhere that uh, the coach wants to put me if I can get on the field. Um, yeah, we're, we're extremely, we've got an extremely competitive back three um, group, uh, you know, at the moment it's um, 
it's anyone's position really just got to at the moment just sort of focusing on trying to put my best foot forward and um, you know hopefully keep playing uh, you know good games and um, you know hopefully get, keep getting selected the hurricanes have been blessed with uh leaders throughout the years dane coles who's retired but just finishing his career in japan Ari savi is over there as well tell us about some of the new leaders in the team and how they're stepping up to that uh leadership within the hurricanes team yeah it's good it's um you know obviously we have brad coming back who's a, a very experienced player um and then uh, yeah geordie obviously with a suffle um as a vice captains and then billy as well adding to that group um it's yeah, it just goes to show the depth we've we've got, uh, and then you know you know you got the likes of TJ, uh, 150 games that has yeah you know his competitive edge and it's it's awesome you know they just bounce off each other and I think we've got a real nice dynamic at the moment you know you've got uh, you know your staunch leaders then you have the the ones that lead by actions and the talkers so it's it's good as a um, you know as a third year in the team being able to relate to each individual too you know it's um. It's pretty cool, you know. Brad's obviously my first year playing with him, and um, you know I get along with him pretty well. And so it's, it's awesome to be able to, you know, create those relationships with those those leaders, and it just makes it easier, I reckon, as a, as a new guy in the team, or um, that we can, you know, have the confidence to go up to them, talk to them about anything. Um, and it just creates a nice, nice little environment for us. You're a product of the uh, sporting factory that is Hamilton Boys High School. <laughs> Tell us about your time there. Uh, much to the envy of other schools, uh, it's quite a it's quite a special school. Yeah, I think that's the way to sum it up. It's a special school. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's you know for for a young kid growing up in the Waikato, um, they epitomise you know what it means to be a a boss. I suppose what it means to grow up and live and breathe rugby, but not also that to also become a you know a, a great young man. Also, um, you know, study they, uh, comes before sport. So I remember when we were there. You know, if, you, if your marks went up to the scratch, uh, Mr. Hotham didn't mind pulling you from the 23 for that week, and um, I think that was a great way to help us develop and understand that actually rugby. You know, if you can't get your your life or your, you know your books in the right the right place then there's you know there's, there's got to be a, a sacrifice or, or a choice and um yeah so i think it, it taught us as our um you know motto was a, a wise man carves his own, own fortune so um it, it yeah taught us to be uh, great young young men <laughs> now of course um one of the longest headmasters serving headmasters in new zealand is retiring um into this term susan hassel tell us about her being a, a headmaster of a boys' school for nearly 24 years. Yeah, she's, uh, like you say, an outstanding leader. She um, commanded the best out of us, and uh, I think it just epitomises how how great um, she was to, to manage. You know, we had a 2,000-plus role of, of boys at, at, that, at Hamilton Boys, so, um, I mean, to control... <laughs> well, not control, but to, um, you know, help educate us and... Uh, steer us in the right direction. It, it, yeah, honestly, she's yeah, she's one of the best. And of course, um, the rugby program at Hamilton Boys High School has been very successful. Um, tell us about your time uh, where your rugby started, because I believe you weren't always in the top tens, but you worked your way up there mm. to the first fifteen. Yeah, um, like I said, like Hamilton Boys is is a school that uh, every young kid wants to go to. I mean, everyone knows about Hamilton Boys. Um, and it being such a dominant figure in this, uh, I suppose, high school game for such a long time. Um, so yeah, I went to uh, my first year at uh, Hamilton Boys was uh, 2012. Um, little year nine student, obviously you go through the age group. So under 14s, I was in the B team, um, and then uh, and under 15s didn't make the A's or B's, so I had to play uh, social rugby and. So they called them coloured teams. Uh, I was in a group with a few of my mates from from Tiamudu, my hometown, and uh, that was quite cool. We got to play, you know, not uh, you know the smaller community um, colleges, um, and it was just about having fun, you know. Um, and then my year eleven year went through all the more well, pre-season trainings to try and try and make the first or seconds, um, but uh, <laughs> luck, lucked out and had to. 
uh, play under 16s. Uh, not many of the year group that I was in had to play that they were either in the first 15 or, or seconds. Um, so that was a, a tough one to swallow, obviously. You know, you, you guys, you've been through your school year, you know, in a, oh, not a better competition, but uh, a more dominant, uh, probably competitive competition. Um, and then my year 12 year, that's when my whole year group sort of made the first. Um, and that's when I uh, played in the, um, they called it the Colts. Um, so they were sort of the, meant to be the year 11 boys that were coming through that would probably make the first 15 the following year or um, boys like myself that um, you know probably weren't at the second level or first 15 level so again another tough tough one to swallow after doing all the pre-season work and you know <laughs> waking up and you know putting yourself through a lot of a lot of tough tough mornings but uh, it's um, you know showed me how to be persistent and um, and then resilient as well. And then in my last year, again, did the same preseason stuff. And it wasn't actually until um, there was a couple of injuries in the original selected team um, that I was uh, injury replacement to go um, to a, a tour they had in Ireland and Wales. Um, and that's, I suppose, a, I must have played decent enough rugby to, to hang on and um, yeah, stay with the team all the way through for the whole year. So. Um, yeah, my last year at school was my first year in the, the first 15 and they, um, it's funny, they have a 25 caps to get a, um, one of those caps and I finished on 24 which was oh, no. uh, yeah, pretty <laughs> guttering but um, yeah, it's, it's um, one of those things that, you know, it's going to hurt, hurt for a little while but <laughs> nah, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Now, um, of course, your um, last year's super, uh, the Super 8 competition, you went on to the Nationals, played against another very powerful team in Hastings Boys High School mm. and uh, just narrowly got pipped to them. Tell us about that game because there's a number of guys in both those teams that are now playing in the professional environment. Yeah, yeah, they were. They were a powerhouse, all right. They were, um, yeah, I think it's probably one of the best Hastings teams they'll see for, for a long time. Um, you know, when you've got Devon and uh, Falau, uh, Jacob Devery, who's also on our team. If you keep going, Danny Tawala, uh, you know, they'll stack Lincoln. Um, yeah, they were, they were a good team. We <laughs> we were, um, we scored first, so back at boy, uh, school games, it was if it was a draw at full time, the team that scored first, scored the first try, uh, would win. And it was, uh, it was, I think it was 13 10 or 12 9, something like that, three point difference, we were behind. But we had scored first, so um, we decided to take a penalty shot uh, with about 10 to go, and I was the kicker, and I hit the upright. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, uh, and then went on to score uh, another try, so it, it didn't matter in the long scheme of things, but, you know, in the back of your head, it, it did matter. You know, we put a, if that went over, we might have hang on, hung on, but, um, yeah, we, <laughs> that happened. So, um, But, yeah, they were a good team, I mean, it was awesome semi final to be a part of, and um, yeah, they were they were yeah they were a good squad. Mm. You mentioned about uh, those moments, particularly uh, hitting the post, and also about resilience, fighting hard to get into the team. Is that something that you've uh, built into your game as you've gone through in your rugby journey, and you've those sort of moments you've actually built on to become stronger in your game? Yeah, I think um, it's sort of been engraved in me from a pretty early age um, from my parents. Uh, they're dairy farmers um, and yeah they they're uh, you know cla they're, they're hard working stubborn um, you know real, real um, yeah they, they work hard and as a young fella growing up it's um, you know you can see how much uh, you know they do and to get me and my siblings to where we are and you know they, they made a lot of a lot of sacrifices so um, I suppose from then it's sort of, yeah, like I said earlier on, from an early age, it's um, been engraved and um, sort of just been one of our things, uh, you know, have a good attitude and just to work for everything that, you know, you you get. It's like what they say, you know, um, things are things are earned, not given, and um, yeah, they're, they're what, the ones that really shine me that way. Now, one of the reasons why you're uh, in the back three, particularly being a winger, is that you hold a pretty impressive w record over 10 metres in speed. 
I believe it's uh, about one point five nine or something like that. It's pretty quick, isn't oh, it? Yeah, where have you pulled that number from? It? It's probably made up. <laughs> um, it's probably not the flashes going around either. I don't think. I remember when I first started in um, Waikato, there was a there's a leaderboard up there, and um, you know, as a young young nineteen year old, eighteen year old coming out of school, you look up there, and um, Damien's. Uh, Record, I think it was a 144, his was so. When you put a comparison to that, it's, it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, um, your path to professional rugby uh, you did about a year or two playing uh, club rugby at the Waikato, and then you got a phone call in 2019 to travel down to the deep south. Tell us how that came about when you uh, joined up with the Southland Stags. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose I played yeah the Waikato under 19s and um, yeah did what, two or three years in the Waikato uh, club system. Um, you know, sort of HP, so wider training group with with Waikato and um, and then it came yeah 2019. I did the uh, national sevens when it used to be still running, and I um, uh, made the uh, New Zealand development squad and. It was after that that um, Dale McLeod gave me a phone call and, yeah, just sort of expressed his interest in getting me down to Southland. And, um, you know, for me, uh, I was sort of in a position where, you know, I, uh, there was great outside backs at Waikato at that stage. Um, and I was sort of like, oh, well, you know, this is this is what I wanted. This is my dream, you know, to play, uh, um, you know, professional rugby in New Zealand. And um, so, yeah, I jumped at that opportunity to, to play for the Stags. Um it is a great place too, you know. Invercargill, they get a they get a bad rap, but um, you know, yeah, because it's so secluded, and you know, you get to know everybody around the, the community very well, and um, you know, it's a, they look after you like the you know you're one of their own. So um, yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's it, it was a great a great point of uh, you know my young young career. Did you get to go duck hunting during uh, the annual holiday down there? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's, uh, yeah, never heard of that before. You know, they make a holiday for for duck shooting. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, part of that also is before you uh, uh, joined the Hurricanes, you had the experience of joining uh, experience in the Highlanders camp. Uh, tell us about uh, being in the Highlanders um, in that environment. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, much just like uh, it was. It was cool. You know, um, very unexpected for for me to to get that chance to to be in a Super Rugby environment. Um, Aaron Major was the coach at the time, the first uh, the first instance I went in there, um, and he was he was awesome. You know, he gave me the call and um, you know just allowed me to be a to be a learner, I guess, and just experience the whole the whole way the system worked, and um, you know also you know be involved and. And everything that they did, um, so there was, you know, a day here and there that um, I'll drive up uh, from Invercargill, so you know, a two and three quarter drive to Dunedin, um, and you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, it was the best thing ever driving up there and um, you know, immersing myself along long shoulders with, you know, some of the legends. So um, that was that was cool. And then the following year it was when I got the chance to be an injury replacement. So. Um, Packed up my stuff from Invercargill and uh, yeah, lived in Dunedin for what six months. Uh, that was when the first year of the uh, Super Rugby Aotearoa comp, um, and I was uh, yeah, like I said, like an injury replacement, but um, also also felt like I was um, you know, putting my best foot forward there and uh, learning and developing as a player as well. Um, you know, living and breathing rugby every day is. Um, it was a pretty cool thing to do, and I think it helped me, um, you know, enhance my game and, and learn how to be a, a better rugby player. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit better than changing tyres and <laughs> you know a little bit of a nine to five job that that I might be doing in Invercargill. But um, yeah, it was a a wicked time to be um, yeah, part of that environment. When you were at the Southland Stags, you joined the team when. They had a one of the not so greatest records in New Zealand rugby, but you ended up uh, winning quite some impressive games, including uh, beating Wellington in one game out at uh, Jerry Collins Stadium. So tell us about um, 
not only that game beating Wellington, but also some of the other highlights of the, that time in the uh, Stags jersey. Yeah, um, well, that was the thing when I first went down. I didn't actually realise uh, the record that they had, um, and then you know, bang along some of the boys that hadn't actually won a game um, for the Southland Stags. You know, they might have been injured for a game that they won, and so that you know, there was forty odd, thirty odd games, and they hadn't hadn't had a win. Um, but that year we had a we had a pretty good team that year, I, I felt. Um, you know, we had Marty McKenzie at ten, and um, he he steered the ship pretty well. Obviously, a classy player. Um, and yeah, so we were close the week before we got that evasive win. Um, we were playing one or two at home, and we were up twenty six seven at half time. And then uh, Nani Lamapi decided to to play some rugby, and he he, oh, <laughs> yeah, he scored a hat trick. <laughs> In the second half, and um, we lost. The, <laughs> let that game slip. Um, but then the following week, we had Kiani's, um at home again, and you know it was. We could feel that the win was coming in that group, and um, yeah, it was good. It was an awesome, awesome atmosphere for, um, to <laughs> to finally reward the reward the community and the crowd for turning out every week to with a win. It was it was cool. And then the following year. Um, we got off to a good start. We yeah, like you said, we beat Hawks Bay at home. Um, we're close to Bay Plenty away, and then beat Harbour at home again. And then um, yeah, we had a pretty good season. You know, it felt like we were gonna, um, you know, that was when the comp was still split. So it was just had to make the top four, and we would have made a semi final to hopefully uh, promote ourselves. Um, and we made the semi, I think, that year, but uh, lost to who did we lose? Lost in the semi to somewhere I can't remember, but um, yeah, it was the first time Southland had been in a, a semi-final for a long time. So um, again, it was a it was a cool group to be a part of, and um, you can definitely see down there. You know, they the Southland supporters are ferociously uh, supportive of their teams. Um, so it was cool to, to see how how involved that they were getting. Now, of course, in 2022 to now, um, you moved from one end of the uh, island from the bottom to the top up to Northland so tell us about yeah. uh, playing for the Tony Fair up there and um, what's it like when you have you ever played against the Stags in the uh, teal jersey of Northland yeah yeah um, that was a tough move um, obviously Southland who had given me the opportunity and my first first taste of of uh, NPC rugby um, so it was hard to, to leave um, such a great group uh, but for me, it was it was to get closer to home, and um, Northland gave me that opportunity. Um, so yeah, it was under George Cunia, um, who's a, a, a great man, um, gave me the chance up there. And the famous Cambridge Blue was was a very very cool team. Um, you know, they again they like South, and they just play for each other and play for the community, play for the jersey. Um, and that was it was a great. That was when the team uh, competition came back together as a full. Um, full group so to make the quarter final that first year up there was it was awesome we did some pretty cool things um, you know we we had Taranaki first um, away and uh, they had obviously just won the competition um, the year before um, and yeah we managed to knock them over right on right on full time and again like when you're in a team that you know aren't known for getting many wins um, yeah, it does wonders for, for the group and our, our environment and that whole year was so positive and we really felt like something was growing. Um, and yeah, we managed to make the quarterfinal um, and I think get pretty close to beating Canterbury, I think. Um, again, a, a great team down at a, um, you know their home stadium is a, is a tough place to win, but um, we definitely gave it our best shot. Um, but yeah, for the last two years, it's been a been an awesome, awesome team to be a part of. And again, we've got some great players, um, some great boys getting some... Um, some good time at that Super Rugby level, so um, yeah, hopefully uh, they can continue that. Now, of course, um, we're based here in Wellington, mostly club, club, club rugby, but you had the opportunity back in 2022 to play for a Wellington club and being the Upart Rams. Tell us about playing out at Maidstone for the Rams and what was a, a pretty entertaining game. It was like a 21 all draw against Johnsonville. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was cool. The yeah, Upart Rams are a Great, great club team. Um, yeah, we played. We we're playing actually in Johnsonville, so up on the 
Oh, yes. Up yeah. on the caged in field, I remember when I first uh, drove in there, you know, you got a massive drive in, and you're just like, holy. Um, but, yeah, like you say, it was entertaining. We were up at half time, and I thought, oh, yeah, we, yeah. you know, we'll hopefully, you know, get away with it here. And, um, yeah, credit to Jay, well, they came back yeah. and gave us a, a good second half, and, yeah, we drew 21 all, so um, disappointing for us. But, yeah, it was a cool, cool club game to be in. They give you plenty of advice on top of the hill, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. They let you know what's going on. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, one of the more uh, important highlights in your professional rugby career to date was uh, making the Murray All Blacks in 2022. Uh, one game. Tell us about the experience of being part of the Murray All Blacks, uh, particularly the influence of your iwi, uh, Nati Maniapoto. Yeah, it's... Um... It's a special team, like I've never really, uh, you know, as, as my career's fold on, I was always in the, in the goal book to, you know, make make that team to be able to represent my heritage and, and my culture and, yeah, like you say, represent my iwi. Um, and for me, it's a, it's a massive honour to be in that team and uh, to share the field with some of the, the, uh, the guys that I did. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great environment to be a part of. Um, fully immerse yourself in, in Māori culture and to learn a lot about uh, the history and um, everything that it means to be a Māori um, boy in New Zealand. It's, um, yeah, it, was an awesome, it was an awesome thing to be a part of. Very special, yeah, very privileged to be, be in it. Now this Easter weekend Saturday, you're playing the uh, Highlanders down in Dunedin, Forsyth Bar. Um, it's going to be quite an important game before the bye. Um, the Highlanders are not a bad team mm. this year, but you've got a very special mm. occasion for one of your uh, teammates who's bringing up 100 games. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be um, an awesome occasion for Tyrell, uh, 100, 100 games. And he's, you know, uh, I think it was about 30 of them for, was for the Highlanders. Um, so it'll be a, a special night for him. Um, but yeah, they are. They're, they're a great team. They're a gritty team. They'll stay in, in it for, you know, the full 80 um, so yeah, we we know the the challenges they're going to bring, and um, yeah, I'll, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a good night. Um, Saturday night's going to be a tough tough one, but yeah, we're ready for it. Now, after the bye, the Hurricanes have quite a period of tough games coming up as well. So, what's going to be the keys to the Hurricanes continue on their fine form for the rest of Super Rugby this year? Um, I think if we just stay disciplined and um, and, and our you know our week our detail uh, throughout the week and how we we approach uh, each game, um, yeah, I think uh, we're in a pretty good spot at the moment. So um, we just got to continue doing what we're doing, and um, you know we'll be hopefully maintain this this role. Now, also we'll finish off. Um... Apparently you're a pretty good golfer as well, from what I hear. Um, have you got? Are you, are you better than Geordie Barrett yet? Nah, shoot, no, no way. <laughs> nah. <laughs> well, Easy, Josh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Josh, it's been fantastic having you on tonight. All the best for the weekend and the rest of the season. Cheers, thank you. We're here with Josh Morby, the uh, utility back for the. Well, great interview there with, there with Josh Morby. Um, and the Hurricanes going outstandingly well. And no doubt we'll see them continue on their fine way. They've got the ball this weekend. Um, hopefully, uh, apologies for the audio issue at the start of the broadcast. Um, just a new little thing that we're trying and uh, didn't press the right button. Uh, but we got that done in the end. So um, it's good to see that uh, we've got it working. Uh, we also tried a new piece of technology there with... Uh, wireless technology uh, we're not using it tonight there's just a little thing there was a little background noise that we're trying to work on uh, with that one now we're going to uh, preview the fixtures for Swindale Shield we're going to do something a little bit different this year rather than me just rambling through them uh, we're going to get someone on each week to have a look and make their predictions and their thoughts and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to introduce um, someone who knows club rugby very well um, and that is Adam Julian Adam Julian from Club Rugby has also been on our show multiple times as well. And hopefully Adam can hear us. Uh, Adam, are you coming through clearly? Not yet. We'll just uh, 
just work on that for you. Just bear with me for a second. Um, let's just try that now. So should hopefully be coming through. Uh, Adam, are you there? Not there yet. It should be coming through very soon. But we'll give uh, him talking about his, his views on club rugby coming up for the season ahead. So we'll just... Uh, We'll just try that again very soon. It's pre-season after all. We're just getting used to all the technology. So just bear with us for a sec. We'll give him another go. And hopefully that comes through very soon. So in the meantime, we'll just hit pause there for a sec. I believe we might have Adam now. Kia ora. G'day, Adam. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly, Brad. You're forgiven for some teething problems. It's only pre-season. It's only March, but there's always a great deal of optimism in March, of course. Autumnal weather conditions. And, you know, the best thing about the beginning of the rugby season, Brad, is the sound of sprigs on concrete. That's when I know it's rugby time. And, of course, the grounds, of course, have been pretty hard with concrete lately. We're glad to have some rain uh, to try and soften it out. But um, who would have thought Club Rugby, you know, back in January, we thought we've still got four months. It's already here. We're already ready to go. And today on Club Rugby, alongside yourself and Stephen White and a few other contributors, gains and losses came out today. And, as always, it's a merry-go-round of players. Absolutely. It's always one of the more enjoyable pieces that, the Club Rugby editorial team puts together because the jigsaw puzzle on who might win the Jubilee Cup in four months begins to become somewhat clearer. You can see the relative strength and weaknesses of each club against each other. There's always some surprises. And with the gains and losses, there's always some late additions or possible disguising from the clubs as well. Now, of course, one of the new features we're going to do here on Huddy Sports this year is mainly I preview the games and I go through and make my predictions. But I feel that, of course, I think we might do a bit of competition each week with someone different. And I thought we'll kick you off with this week in terms of your picks for this weekend uh, for round one of the Swindale Shield. And we're going to look at our first feature game uh, this weekend is Ori's versus Parramatta Plimerton. You're calling that game on Te Puka or Te Ika on radio this weekend. Uh, your thoughts on this replay of the Jubilee Cup final from last year? Well, goodness, it's going to be a magnificent occasion at the Polo Ground. Oriental Rongatai stunned the whole competition last year, Brad, when they won six elimination matches in a row to capture the Jubilee Cup, and they demolished Parramatta Plymouth on that bleak, miserable, but euphoric day for the Magpies at the Hut Wreck. The Hammerheads have won 14 consecutive games. They beat every club in the competition last year, but unfortunately stumbled at the last hurdle. And remember, Ori's victory was built on a colossal forward effort. Dominic Ropetti won the Jim Brown medal as the best player of the final. He scored two tries and dictated terms in the lineouts, and there were immense contributions from the likes of Connor Lemon and the entire Oriental Rongatai reserve forwards as well. They carried on the momentum after Palamata Plymouth had taken a pummeling in the first half. So I suspect that Oriental Rongatai will try and rinse and repeat. They've had a good pre-season. They had a victory up in Palmerston North against Kia Toa, and they're an athletic and powerful side with very few players departing, although Fetu Henry is the new coach. Henry's little introduction to club rugby fans, he's a double centurion. They've gained 
Chicago Doyle from Marison Pats. He's a dazzling outside back mm. who played recently for the Wellington Lions. Oliver I is unretired. That's a wonderful thing about the beginning of 2024. <laughs> The retired become unretired and then they become retired again. Herman Siuvan Fungi is back from rugby league. He made such a huge impression at St. Pat's Town a couple of years back. So wonderful to see him back in the competition. So Ori's a very settled and powerful lineup, but the same can be said about Panamata Plymouth and they've mm. gained five first fifteen captains in the off season, which is a real tribute to their recruiting and the Appeal of Panamata Plymouth and now Nati Tau Domain refurbished. Wonderful history project going on with the Ken Gray mm. Legacy project. project. And they picked up some uh, fantastic players, Brad. Alex Fido from Ori's has migrated across to Nati Tau. And Alex Fido was a bullocking prof in the Wellington Lions and the Hurricanes. He shed about 40 kilos mm. and is playing in the loose forward. So he's going to be a very exciting uh, prospect this season. Yeah. And of course, for Panamata Plymouth and to repeat their success, they'll look to the likes of Sam Clark and Essie Common Vasai, mm. who combined so well last year. Louis Northcott, on his first touch of the ball from the Horofanua Cup, he scored a try in Levin and ran for the Shield defence. And he got 15 tries last year. He was magnificent. So I haven't answered your question, but I suspect that Ori's at home might just sneak a victory here. Uh, so you're going, or is that game? I might go Parramatta Plumerton because I've got to be on side of my first guest that I had on tonight. Um, game number two. Well, I think the interesting course... thing about the grand final replays, Brad, is that they tend to be very close. So mm. in the last 18 grand final replays, the team that won the grand final the previous year has won 11 times, and the runner-up has won seven times. But the runner-up has actually won the last two. And last year, sensationally, mm. But Tony, who lost that blockbuster Jubilee Cup final to Norse at Jerry Collins Stadium, they were beaten 41-3 the next year by Batoni. So there'll be plenty of motivation and no shortage of ammunition in the Paramount of Plymouth side. I wouldn't be surprised if the Hammerheads won that game, but I have to choose someone, and I might as well yep. choose the opposite of you to make this competition more engaging. <laughs> game two has always been a heavyweight match over the years. Norse versus Mara St. Pat's out at Jerry Collins Stadium. Um, both clubs have had a lot of movements, more so Maris St. Pat's, but they've recruited well again, um, and they've got Sean Horan coaching them this year. I'm going Maris St. Pat's in this game. What are you picking? I agree, Brad. Maris St. Pat's look like they have assembled a very strong roster this year to be spearheaded by Sean Horan, who's a coach of real repute. Perhaps his most famous assignment was coaching the Black Fern Sevens when they started back in 2012, and what a juggernaut they've become. Horan had them until 2016, finished with a silver medal at the Rio de Janeiro Olympics. That was the first time that women had played sevens at the Olympics, but under Horan, New Zealand won the world seven series titles it was back then twice and Honey Hirami was in the side. She was a brilliant player and now a face of commentary on Sky TV and Huriana Manuel was a captain for several seasons so highly regarded that she was put in the World Rugby Hall of Fame last year. Mm. Sean Horan comes from the famous Horan Marison Pats rugby family. They won so many Jubilee Cups in their time, the Horns, they couldn't even shut the wardrobe. Now, <laughs> some Pats, well, they've picked up some wonderful players in the off-season. Perhaps the most notable gains have been Grayson Whitman, who's jumped between mm. Ori's and MSP in the past. He's with the Scarlets this year. Amon Carr, that wonderful, robust lock from Tawa, has jumped across to Evans Bay Park. Remember, he started at Johnsonville, stirring player, Amon Kari survived the cancer scare many years ago. Ivan Fepulia is back from Australia. He's a pop oh, board. He's been playing semi-professional rugby in Perth. And Ivan, one of the funniest and most charismatic guys you've ever met. If you've ever met Ivan Fepulia, ask him to put on ESPN sports commentator accents. Thoroughly entertaining. And however, Marison Pats have lost a significant figure. And this mm. was one of the biggest 
trades in the off-season. For Tolu Feely is now coaching the Wellington Axemen. Northern United, they had a miserable season last year. They only won two matches. Johnny Talianga is back. The Rugby League stalwart, who's also played a century of games and won two Jubilee Cups at fullback. And Jay Burns, he's a good young player out of yeah. uh, St. Pat's Town. He impressed us last year, didn't he, Brad? Oh, he was brilliant. He was a great halfback. And um, you're pretty quick and pretty snappy as well. Running halfbacks at him. That's what we need more in rugby. We had that with Cam Roygaard until he got injured. Goodness me, it's so sad, the Cam Roygaard injury. It's amazing how trends can develop in sports at the moment. Mm. If you watch the NRL, the fullbacks are almost like a third standoff these days, injecting themselves in the line. What a beautiful exhibition of NRL Rugby League on a Sunday involving Caelan Ponger and Roger Tui Varsashek. But in rugby, the running halfback is back. And really, mm. that's the cause of Dupont from France, who was so magnificent in the French resurgence. You know, France won 14 tests in a row, including all 10 in 2022. And mm. I was only the second team in the professional era after the 2013 All Blacks, who were 14-0, and 0, to win every single test match in a professional season. And that was built off Dupont's brilliant running game. Mm. You look at the Super Rugby at the moment, those two boys at the Chiefs, Cortez Ratana and Xavier Rowe, prolific running halfbacks. And, of course, let's get back to the Swindale Shield. Kyle Preston scored a bundle of tries last yeah. year. Cam Ferreira at Batoni is a whippet. So, yes, a running halfback, something to watch for in the first round. And, of course, Logan Henry with Batoni as well. But we'll get to him soon. Next game we're looking at, well, I was speaking to uh, Dougal Perez at the start of the season, caught up with him coffee, and I said, what's the one game that the Billy Goats, All Boys University, are looking to the most? And it's, he said, it's their round one opener against Johnsonville. Because last year, Johnsonville spoiled the party at Helston Park. They didn't just beat the Billy Goats, they smashed them. So Johnsonville, another club, like Parramatta Plimerton, had a great season, season, but Old Boys University have recruited quite well again. They've got some key players back back again, and I'm picking them at Rugby League Park this Saturday. Your thoughts, Adam? That's going to be a fantastic game, Brad. Johnsonville spoiled a lot of teams' parties last year with their resurgence. Best ever year for the Hawks since they won the Swindale Shield way back in 1998. In 1998, Bill Clinton was the president, for goodness sake. John yeah. on fire in 2023. Old Boys University, well, they've won four Jubilee Cups since 2015. Last year, they lost the semi-final to Paramata Flemington by a point. They were ahead at half-time and had to substitute Caleb Delaney in that game, which was a telling factor in the Hammerhead success because Caleb had scored a 40-metre runaway try and was dominating the lineouts, and he's carried on that magnificent form with the Hurricanes this season. Old Boys University, they picked up Tafuka Pahungo from mm. Tarwa. That's a big addition. Tafuka's a midfielder who thrived for the Hurricanes under-20s in Topol recently. Boston Hunt, who was the player of the final two years ago, he's back in club rugby, and he's playing for OBU. He's a well-educated mm. young man and a terrific player. His brother's there too as well. Some international yeah. recruits in the OBU roster, so that will add some flavour to their team. And two youngsters that I'm really excited about in 2024. Harry Irving was the captain of the Scots First 15 last year. They won the Premiership undefeated. He was a lock and loose forward. He's in the Wellington Rugby Academy. They tell me he's an exceptional leader and a fine young man. And so he'll cover multiple positions in the back row. And Ollie Cuff is a young halfback out of St. Pat Silverstreet. He struggled with injury last season, but this kid can really play. Mm. And 20 minutes against Palmerston North Boys High School, who are a very strong side, he scored 20 points by himself. And so look out for OBU and Ollie Cuff and Kyle Preston to have a real arm wrestle for a starting place. Johnsonville... Well, they played some breathtaking rugby last year, and really it was their back line that did the damage. Guys like Mark Sutton and Jacob Wormsley, the fullback, but they added some ruggedness 
and cohesion to their uh, forward pack. OBU might narrowly edge this one at home, but expect mm. a tight finish. Exactly. OBU for that one. And um, the game on Huddy Sports uh, this sad day that we're live streaming is Batoni Tower. Um, now, last year, um, it was a narrow loss to Batoni against Tower at the start of the Jubilee Cup competition. And Batoni kicked themselves that day that day because they should have won it. Um, but traditionally, this game always goes down to the wire, except for last year's Swindell Shield, where we saw that special moment, Stanley Solomon, four tries. I'm going Batoni in this one, just being the home factor, and the fact also I have to live stream the games as well, so that's probably a reason why. Um, but you're Adam. You've called, You've commentated a number, a number of uh, Batoni Tower games. Your thoughts? Well, there's been some cracking numbers between those two teams over the years. There was a day at Lyndhurst Park that you and I were present at where it was so windy the gazebo flew away. That was a very dramatic moment. Oh, it sure was. Batoni, yeah. we have a clue about how they're going to play because last Friday they featured on Sky Television. They beat Ponsonby of Auckland at 41-33 in Ponsonby's 150th anniversary game. And Batoni must have conceded 15 kilos to a man. The ponies were absolutely enormous, but Batoni mm. tackled with great heart and fervour and precision, and they managed to cause a sensational win. Stanley Solomon was key in that. TJ Clark, two tries and 19 points. And Luiami Fine, who's been in the Moana Pacifica squad, he played at centre in this game and scored two tries. Tana Rumanga, the Batoni legend and Moana Pacifica coach, presented Batoni with their jerseys before kickoff. Luiami Fine was obviously pretty motivated to impress the coach. Tana hasn't picked him for a month. He should oh. pick him for Moana Pacifica because if he doesn't, he'll be a regular feature in the Batoni midfield. And so Batoni, a smaller side, but very tenacious defensively and with backs that can really hurt mm. you in broken play. Tawa, as we know, are historically very big and powerful in the forwards. Although Amon Carr is a big loss for them, but they'll have yeah. Harry Plummer, who's been such an impressive captain out there. And they've also picked up some players from Hawke's Bay in Australia and Mana, so they've cast the net wide, have Tawa. But Petoni, a narrow victory at home. And of course, so getting close to the end of the games for round one. But let's have a look at this one here. The Up Art Rams against Poor Nicky. The Rams at home with their new facility. And it's pretty spanking new. You haven't been out there yet, but I've heard it's a great place. But they've had a big loss this year, Adam. And it's their captain and their star number eight from last year, Toby Crosby. He's gone to the Warriors. How much is that going to be a loss for the Rams? Well, it's a significant loss because he's such a powerhouse off the back of the scrum. He makes yardage in difficult situations. He's almost impossible to stop when Upper Hutt have attacking scrums close to the line. Protein Crosby, 25 tries in 25 games. So that is a huge hole to fill. But Upper Hutt is a place that's really booming at the moment. Malcolm Gilly's developments have really transformed the entire place. Here's a thought. Why don't we put Malcolm Gillies as the Wellington Mary, get more done than that current crowd in the <laughs> capital. And yes, right about uh, that. Upper Hutt uh, have recruited uh, very strongly. They've uh, picked up players from uh, Poverty Bay, Wainui Mata, Manawa 2. Adam Campbell is the coach. He's won two Jubilee Cups with Hutt Old Boys Marist in the past. And his son, Yetatiah Campbell, is joining Upper Hutt this year. He had five years in the Scots College first 15. That's a thousand episodes of Shorten Street. And they've also picked up the vast majority of the Silverstream first 15 who have performed so strongly in the last two years. They won the Premiership in 2022, made the final and won all six of their traditionals last year. Alex Hewitt, that's Norm Hewitt's son, is going to Upper Hutt. So too is Jackson Mendoza, who's a tenacious and versatile macro forward. And David Pokalatawa, wonderful outside back. We saw him, Brad, play halfback 
and fullback in the Silver Stream first 15. Um, let's look at Wainui Avalon. Always been a tough match between these two sides. Um, but Wainui have recruited quite well, particularly in the back line. They've actually taken Mara St. Pat's uh, most prolific scorer in the last decade, Andrew Wells. How much of an impact is he going to be out there at William Jones? Well, he'll be a massive impact. He's a centurion of the competition, a prolific scorer. Why do we matter? have struggled for depth in their uh, back line. So Will, Wells will add a lot of stability. Would be remiss of me, though, to neglect uh, Pornicki in that last uh, oh, yes. raid that I had. I didn't actually mention a Pornicki or predict a winner. Uh, Brad, we love the Pornicki uh, Rugby Club. Uh, they've recruited strongly, too. they got DJ Taupo from Manawatu. And Devin Sopawanga's come across from Upper Hutt. They've also got two players from the UK, Charlie Manger, and yeah. Oliver Wingham, we're told to watch, but they have lost a bundle of players too, including Wellington Lions halfback Sam Howling. They'll be very competitive at Colburny Park. Ross Bond is the coach, assisted by Reg Good, so you know the approach is going to be no nonsense. I suspect Up Hart will beat them at home, but Pornecki and Colburny Park could be a fortress this year. Why do we matter? Mm. William Jones Park, that's always a fortress as well, and one of their good young players in. 2024 is Braden Soy. He's a loose yeah. forward and lock out of Silverstream. As year 11, he did a Mondo Duplantis over a ruck to score a match leveling try in a final. He'll add some athleticism to a side who I accuse of being aging every year because it's true. <laughs> but Wainu Imata have wonderful uh, stalwarts and they'll be looking to have a better season than they did last year where they only won a few games. But some uh, fresh blood over at Wainui Amata should uh, shake things up and they have a traditional rivalry with Avalon who haven't really gained too many players in the off season but they will put out a competitive uh, team nonetheless probably their mm. most significant acquisition is Quinn O'Kane mm. out of the St Bernard's College you taught that lad you taught him everything he knows evidently and so that's why I think Avalon will lose the game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, of course, our last game for round one is the Wellington Axemen taking on Huddle Boys Maris. Uh, Huddle Boys Maris have a few players returning. They've been absent for a few few years. Um, but Wellington, last year, the Swelladellas getting smashed in nearly every game. Far Tonafeli has moved out there. He's taken a few former Maris players with him uh, from Maris St. Pat's. Um, this is at High Tido Park. I'm going hard old boys Maris, but I don't expect the Axemen to be much improved. Well, I hope you're right, Brad. It's been an almighty struggle for the Axemen the past two seasons. They haven't won a game and haven't really got close, to be honest, but they have reason for optimism with Fatonu Feely involved in the coaching department. He played 20 seasons in this competition. He was a Manu Samoa international. He's an individual with a tremendous mana in Wellington. So hopefully he can rejuvenate Maris, uh, sorry, uh, Wellington uh, Football Club, uh, Maris and Patch. You just automatically think Maris and Patch when it's uh, Fatonu yeah. Feely. But hello, boys, Maris, this is a good-looking side. They have had a strong pre-season. They won the Spillane tournament in Taupo, which includes Maris and Pats, and they have the core of their group back from last year and some really strong gains. So Keenan Higgins from the Hawks Bay has returned to Wellington. He won a Jubilee Cup in 2019 with Northern United. He'll really strengthen the Eagles' midfield. Ironically, his brother Riley in the Hurricanes plays for Batoni. Harry Priest is back from Otago. Now, Harry was a very formidable player when he was at Hutt International Boys School, made a number of rep sides, played senior footy in Otago. And Sam Morgan was the captain of a very good silver stream at first 15, and he too has played Premier Rugby in Otago. So those three guys alone are going to add a lot. They're young, fit, and capable. 
And two names I'm excited to see back. Beretti Saloa mm. has returned from a period in rugby league. Goodness knows what colour his hair will be this season. But he's wonderful uh, to watch those quick feet, dazzling runaways. He's won a Jubilee Cup. He's a real charismatic presence in the Huddle Boys Maris team. And Albert Polu has returned. And he's another one that's had a mm. period in rugby league. And he's a bruising player. He scored 29 tries in 18 games for the Silver Stream Purse for Dean in 2017. If he can return in shape and produce that kind of form, Huddle Boys Maris. They're going to cause problems this year. Yeah, exactly. So if we um, look at our comparisons, Adam, the only game that we don't agree on is the rematch of the Jubilee Cup final. We've gone uh, different ways on that one. Um, So, yeah, we'll see how good our predictions are. Well, Adam, alongside Stephen White, also run clubrugby.nz. And you can see the website... On your screens there, clubrugby.nz. The Don Post, well, don't need to commentate on any or write on any local sport anymore. But Club Rugby is a great asset. And Adam, what you and Stephen White do is a great asset to the rugby community. Well, uh, thank you. And it's not just uh, Stephen and I. Stephen carries most of the burden. He's been the editor for 20 years. It's actually 20 years since Club Rugby was pioneered way back in 2005, that year, the Jubilee Cup was won by Batoni and Earl Va'a kicked a sideline mm. conversion late in the game to win the Villagers a dramatic Jubilee Cup final, 21-20 against Norse at the then-named Westpac Stadium. It was 20-6 to at one stage in that game to Norse, but Batoni rallied to win. So 2005 was also the year the British and Irish Lions were swept 3-0, so it's amazing to think that club rugby has been around so long. But there's a number of contributors, Andy MacArthur and Mike Lewis, among an army of photographers who assist us. And, of course, the rugby public who actually read us. <laughs> They're the most important right. people of all. Yeah. So if you've got ideas for stories or wish to make a contribution anyway, please don't hesitate. Well, Adam, uh, many thanks for being on and uh, doing your picks for round one and all the best on Saturday with your call looking forward to it that's Ori's against Paramata Plymouth and Tia Puka Otiika is the name of the station they're 10 years old too Brad some of these funny coloured hairs of the stones will emerge on us really hint at our longevity but Tia Puka Otiika 10 years old Paramata Plymouth versus Ori's Lee Campbell with me at the polo ground from 245 awesome Thank you, Adam. And, of course, just a reminder, our feature game on Saturday on Huddy Sports YouTube Live, Batoni and Tawa will be our game we're covering. I'll be commentating that one um, for that game as well, alongside Luke Dunlop and also hopefully one of the Batoni players we might have on as well. Well, always here at Huddy Sports, we're grateful to be covering a whole lot, not just rugby, but also First 15 rugby and other sports as well. Uh, We've locked in the college sport winter finals again for 2024. Um, If you're willing to help Huddy Sports in particular, um, we're looking for sponsors as always. We're expanding quickly, um, but we're always grateful for support. So if you're willing to help us out to keep us covering sport, in particular make it free on YouTube, and on our website, please uh, go to our website and flick us a message on our contact page there. So we look forward to you helping us out as well. But also we'd like to thank our current sponsors that have come back on a board for 2024. Livery's Ready, New Zealand Travel Brokers. So if you need any help with overseas travel and plans, Louise, fantastic at that job. So she's into our third year of supporting us at Huddy Sports. So many thanks, Louise. And particularly when we started, Michael Pinfold, Plumbing and Drain Lane Limited, is our longest sponsor, and he's a great asset to rugby. He's a former Premier Referee, Premier referee still refereeing as well. 
and sponsors, not only referees and us, but the wider rugby community as well. So make sure you give them a plug uh, because they're great people and they help us keep going with our live streaming and promoting sport here in the Wellington region. Well, that's been our jam-packed Huddy Hui for 2024, episode one. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We've already got guests lined up for the first lot of weeks of the year. So, And if you're interested in being part of our picking of the rounds in terms of who you think are going to win, just flick us a message, whether it be on our social media pages, Instagram or Facebook, or email us at huddysports uh, nz at gmail.com. So many thanks for watching and listening to the Hui tonight. And we'll be back next Wednesday uh, for episode 102 for 2024. And don't forget, live stream Batoni Tower. Coverage starts at 2.40 on Saturday this week for the Batoni Recreational Ground. I'm Brad Hudson. Ciao for now.